Our call to worship is Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for, your, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the people praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its, yields its harvest. God, our God, bless us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Happy Mother's Day, and welcome to this, the 10th of May, which is Mother's Day, the service at Walshville Christian Church, and may God bless every mother that's out there. Today, we're remote again, as you can tell, but we do have the family in, in, in the auditorium here, and so we're kind of setting up and preparing for getting back together live, and so our plans, just to let you know, when we do get back together live, for those who are not able to come out when we do meet live, we will still record it, much like we're doing today. Although we may not have the slides, you should have something similar to what you're seeing today. So hopefully that will still allow many of us to worship together. Our first song this morning is How Great Thou Art. Let's go ahead and sing page two, How Great Thou Art.
awesome God who is great. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I'm glad everyone can join us here online um, this Sunday, May 10th. As I said, it is Mother's Day, and may God's blessing go out to every mother out there, especially in this time where they may not be able to get together with their children, that they may not get together and go out to, to eat. So let's just remember them in our prayers. Let's also remember uh, just the people that are are suffering during this time, suffering with the disease, suffering from being isolated. Let's keep all those in our prayers. Uh, finally, I just want to give a shout out <clears throat> to those on our birthday list. We have Kathy Johnson, happy birthday coming up, and Ruth Ann Ruthford, happy birthday coming up. This week is your birthdays, and so happy birthday to you. May God bless you on your bless this special day. And or wait, that's the other one. But anyway, let's continue on with a prayer, and then we will continue on with song. Please pray with me. Lord, I thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity we have to gather as your people, to gather, and even though we're remote, even though we're at each, each of us are at our own houses and we're watching this on the internet, Lord, may your spirit Bind us together. May our prayers go up before you as one, as we lift them up. And Lord, I to this morning, I just ask that you will bless the mothers that are out there that are distant from their children if they happen to have left the house. Um, please let them know of, their, of your love for them and can grant them a blessing of peace and joy. I thank you so much uh, for the way that you continue to show love in the world, that you continue to show your love in our life and how you have shown your love through mothers. So Lord, this day we ask for that blessing. And Lord, I also just ask that you'll continue to, to comfort those that are in pain, comfort those that are, are having a hard time dealing with the isolation. Please, Lord, give wisdom to the people that are making rules and trying to grab power where they may not have that power, Lord. Help us to respond with grace. Help us to be your people about your business. And Lord, as we start to get back together, may you continue to guide us and protect us with your wisdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning. Let's all uh, start singing, and we have the words on the screen. Our first song is Jesus Loves Me, page 226 in the hymnals.
mean, that was Yes, Jesus Loves Me. Next song is Whiter Than Snow, page 109. Oh 
our prayer. Our communion hymn is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And so um, we're going to sing our communion hymn. Then Lindo will give us our communion message. And then we will have a communion prayer after that. So our communion hymn is page 439. <clears throat> slept with the wife of a royal commander when then he had to kill him because she became pregnant after this initial denial David broke down in anguish when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan the heart of stone has been replaced with a heart of flesh and now it hurts David's prayer makes it clear that he he is now grief stricken over the sin with Bathsheba. He tells God his bones, spirit, and heart are all broken. Try to recall a time when God revealed to you the deepness of your own sin. How did you feel? Did he comfort you? We can see from Scripture that it is God who gives us a heart soft enough to recognize our rebellion and weep over it. Why would we want to hold it into a heart of stone? Is there anyone around you, around you who seems resilient to having his or her heart broken by God? What would you have to tell this person? David does find forgiveness and prays that God will also restore his joy and salvation. Later, Psalms testifies to the fulfill fulfillment of this petition as well. But it seems that to arrive to the full fullness of such joy, one must first go through mourning. What does this tell you about the relationship between you and your forgiveness. In what ways do you see them functioning together in your life? 
Thank you. Okay, so now it's time for communion. Please grab your cups and um, I will pray and we will go into our communion hymn as we all partake of the cup of the bread and the, and the juice. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity to come before you and to partake in this communion. You tell us to do this in remembrance of you, in remembrance of what you did on the cross, of that sacrifice. You freely gave your life, laid it down to purchase us back, to redeem us from our sins, to wash us away whiter than snow, Lord. And we are so thankful for that. You did what we could not do for ourselves. And you did that out of your great love. You laid down your life for us. Greater love has no man than that. So Lord, this morning as we partake of this, each of us in our own place, may you bind our hearts together. May you renew the spirit within us and allow us to walk in your steps as your people. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, and today we are going to have a sermon that's kind of picked for Mother's Day, but it's, a, it's carrying on from last week as well, and it's entitled, Under Construction, God's Still Working. And I don't know why that says God's still working. That, that clip shouldn't be apostrophe S, but hey, God is still working in us. Maybe it should be. Either way, this is an under construction, Christian under construction, because Mothers know that their job is never done, that their children still need much work, just as God knows we need much work. So to the, today, it's, we're going to talk about under construction, Christians under construction. And it follows up from last week, where I talked about three sets of people. If you recall, if you were with us, I talked about Hophni and Phinehas, and, and about how they hated God. They had no regard for God. They disregarded him. They hated him. And that was an example of someone hating God. His father, um, Eli, was an example of someone who heard God. He was a priest. He knew who God was. And yet he did not hear what God said. He, I mean, he, he heard God, but he did not listen to what God said. He was an example of someone that hears God, but does not listen or does not heed. And we also read about Samuel. And now Samuel was called by God. And that God called Samuel repeatedly, but only when Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, did God then tell Samuel what he wanted him to hear. Samuel was an example of one who heeded God. And that's very important because I, as I closed up that, I provided another example from Scripture of Martha and Mary and how when Jesus visited them at their home, um, Martha, she had her plan, remember? She had a plan on how she was going to serve the Lord. She had a plan on how she was, she was going to take care of his needs. And she was working that plan. And she was upset that her sister was not helping. Not only was, she not, upset, upset, not only was she upset that her sister was not helping, she was upset that her sister didn't really understand how important Martha's plans were for the Lord. She was wanting to serve the Lord. And yet Martha discovered that what the Lord desired was people who listened to him as Mary was, sitting at his feet, listening to his teachings. He wants people who are going to not only hear him, but are going to heed his word, or is going to do what he says. So this past week, then, I challenged each of us, I challenged you to go forth and heed God's word. Not only to hear him, but to go forth and do what he says, to listen to him. I mentioned that God can speak to us through his word, that God can speak to us through his people, and that God can speak to us through his spirit. 
And I hope, I hope that you had success this past week, that you heard God. Remember one of the verses that we included last week was Matthew chapter 7, where it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open." And we read that verse, for everyone who asks receives, he, to him who seeks will find, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. However, sometimes we don't receive a response right away. Sometimes when, when we, we, don't, we don't find what we want when we wake up after a night of prayer. Sometimes we can't see that the door has been opened or that there is an open door. And we're sometimes lost by this. And this often is because we're not ready for what God has for us next. I remember back when, I, when, when God was preparing me to return to the ministry. I went to Lincoln Christian College and Seminary. I went there for ministry. I, after we left there, Kathy and I uh, were ministers at the uh, the Christ Chapel in Rosewood Heights and did that for a number of years and then uh, the doors were shut and I kind of dropped out of the ministry even though I knew at the age of 14 that God called me to the ministry I was kind of out of it and I was working uh, programming uh, operations computer stuff and God called me again and I could tell God was calling me back to the ministry. And I was living on our farmlet. We were raising our family. I was doing my, my computer work. And yet God placed on my heart such a desire to be back in his ministry, doing what he called me to do. And yet I couldn't figure out what that was. Every time I asked, every time I saw it, every time I knocked, it seemed like it was not the direction I should be going. It left me unsettled. And then finally, after months and months, it all became clear. And I believe that it's because I was under construction. I wasn't ready to hear the answer yet, and God prepared me for that. There is something in our life that sometimes needs to be learned or understood before we can see the next step. And God is a great God. He's an awesome God, and he's helping us to grow to completion so that we are prepared for the next open door. We are Christians under construction. He is working in us and through us for his good pleasure. And so you can say we are an unfinished work. We are a work in progress, okay? We are Christians under construction. In Philippians chapter 2, 12, verses 12 and 13, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. This verse here, chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 shows us that we are Christians under construction. We are to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But it also tells us a secret, and that secret is it's not us by our power that's making it happen. It's God who's working in us and through us for his good pleasure. Have you ever had a project that was unfinished? How about you out there on the internet land? Have you ever had a project that was unfinished? I'm going to pretend that, that if you ever, ever saw Romper Room when you were younger, uh, the teacher, she had a magic mirror, and she would hold it up, and she would say, Oh, I see Kurt, and I see Timothy. And, and, and I was just waiting for her to say my name because I just knew she could see through the TV and see to me. Well, I don't have a magic mirror and I can't see Kurt raising his hand or Tim raising his hand. And I don't know if they've ever had an unfinished project, but most of us have had unfinished projects. And I just want to point out that a project is a work that's in process or a project is, is a work in process. And it's a work in process unless the work has stopped. So if, the, if you've stopped working on something, then that is an unfinished project. But if you're continuing to work on it, if you're plugging away, then it's a work in process. So 
until it's finished. Now, unfinished projects, though, they're not good, okay? And in honors of mothers out there who are probably all too familiar with husbands and children who have, have unfinished projects, I just want to add this graphic here. This is for you. If you look at the screen, ladies, if a man says he'll fix it, he will fix it. You don't need to remind him every six months about it. Okay, that was funny. Okay, I, I, I think that was probably a copyright image and I kept the copyright on there, but that just is a funny thing. Sometimes we're slow about finishing our projects, but not completing the job has negative implications. Let me just show you, share a small one with you. At my house, when I go to make coffee for myself in the morning, I use the pod coffee maker, you know, one of those little K-cup pods. And I'm doing that because I'm only making a single cup. And this is how I go about completing that job, okay? In the morning, I wake up, I ensure that the water tank has enough water, and I add water if necessary. If I add water, then I have to make sure that I wipe up what I spill. Otherwise, there will be spilt water on the counter because I can never add it without spilling it. After that, I place a cup under the coffee output spout, and I open the pod receptacle. I place the pod in the proper pod spot. I use the proper pod for my type of coffee. I close the pod receptacle. I select the size and start brewing. As I'm waiting for it to brew, I get to do other stuff. When it's finished brewing, I remove my co coffee cup, replace the lid, and I take a nice swig of my coffee, and that's wonderful. But my job has not been completed because for, for my coffee job of making coffee to be complete, I have to open the pod receptacle, pull out the used pod, and throw it away. Now, that's a very important step. If any of these steps are not completed, it can cause problems. And I try very hard to always remember to remove my used pod. I cannot tell you, though, how many times someone in my house uses the pod coffee maker to make hot water, which is a function that it does, only to find, after they put all their stuff in there and mixed it together for their hot water and their special concoction, to have an old used coffee flavor because the hot water went through a used pod. It's not pleasant for that person. It's an incomplete job. We are a work in progress, and we will never be finished until we reach heaven, until we stand face to face with our creator. Okay, let's read our text today, which is Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, further, my brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord. This is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What more I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in the, his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, obtained all of this, or have already arrived at my goal, 
but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of this then, or all of us then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and the, their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious bodies, his glorious body. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. There is an awful lot packed into there. I really want to focus on verses uh, 13 and following of chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles at home, go ahead and turn to chapter 3 of, of Philippians. And we're going, to, we're going to focus on chapters 12, or <laughs> chapter 3, verses 12 and following. Now, what I want to do is talk about six observations that we glean from the text. Okay, so as I read down through that text, and we're talking about being Christians under construction, that we're under construction, that God is not finished with us yet, here's the six observations that we glean from that, okay? Number one, Paul realized that he himself had not arrived at his goal. If you look at verses 12 and 13, you read that Paul says that he has not attained it. Not that I have already attained it. He knows that he has been made perfect in Christ. That when he submitted to Christ, he became a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, is what Paul says. And yet, he realized that while he was made complete, he is still being made perfect. That it was something he has not attained yet. He, understanding that is important for us. Okay? We are works under construction. And as we understand that we have not arrived yet, that it helps us, it helps keep us from being proud. Okay? It helps also keep us from being lazy about our spiritual growth. Okay? Arise, O oh man of God. Look at the graphic. We're not on R and R. We're not to be sitting leisurely by. But yet we are in a battle, a spiritual battle. And so we need to go forward. Paul says we are not complete. Let's not get lazy. Let's not lay down on the job. Let's continue on and be the people that God has called us to be. Number two, observation. Paul stayed focused. Okay, six observations. Number one, Paul knew he hadn't attained it yet. He stayed humble. Number two, he stayed focused. He pressed on, verses 12 and, four, through four, and 14 says, towards God's purpose for his life. He pressed on. He stayed focused. And that's very important for us. Number three, Paul did not dwell on his past mistakes. If we read the early parts there, he saw that he persecuted the church at one point in time. He was a God hater, so a church hater, a Christ hater for sure, at one point in his life. But he did not dwell on that. Paul had been an enemy of Christians before his conversion, but he moved forward. He was aware of his sins, but confident in God's forgiveness. He was a work under construction. Number four, he trusted God to direct him. 
as we read through the book of Acts, we see that Paul was moved by God's spirit, that he let God control his direction and his actions. And when we are out of fellowship with God, we are less likely to hear his guidance. Remember last week's sermon, are we a God hater, a God hearer, or a God heater? Okay, we need to trust God to direct us, which means we have to listen to him and we have to do what it says. In Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, God is telling Zechariah to talk to the people because we find that the temple of God has not been rebuilt. It's kind of half done. It's in a, it's in a shambles of a state. And the people are not working on it. They have a work, and it's left unfinished. Their project is unfinished, and that's a horrible state for it to be in. Now, Zechariah could have come to the people and rebuked them for not finishing the temple and to get them back on task. But instead, Zechariah encourages the people to finish the job by casting a vision of the completed temple and how one day the Messiah's glory is going to fill it. That it is so important that they finish the job now so that one day in the future, the Messiah will be able to enter that temple. And so he casts the vision for them to, for, as an encouragement for them to get back to work and complete the project. In Zechariah, God tells them, return to me that I may, that I may return to you. Okay, God calls them to finish their project. Number five, go back one. Number four, four was he trusted God to direct him. Paul did. And the people of Zechariah's days trusted God to, 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 um, to, to, to direct them. Number five, Paul, in that, in that Philippians section, Paul made progress. Okay? He continued making progress. And that's so critical for us as Christians. If we are not moving closer to God every day, then we are doing something wrong. Because our life is a journey, and that journey is moving towards God, or we're moving away from God. There is no standing still. If we're standing still, we're missing the boat. We're not moving towards God. Ultimately, you are a work in progress. It's a process. Being a work in process has four pieces here. It's a process called sanctification, which is working out your salvation. Remember that verse? Work out your salvation. It's a sanctification process. And as we are sanctified, as we work out our, 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 our salvation, it produces results in our life. There will be outward signs of the inward changes that we see. If we are not seeing outward signs of our progress, then that's a good indicator that we're not making progress. Okay? Number, two, number three, it requires humility and your conviction of sin. Um, if we go to 1 John 8 through 10, it says, John says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. And then in James 1, through 25, it says, do, we used this last week, by the way. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Okay? It... And, and so the, and so the third, the third one is humility. It requires humility and conviction of sin. And number four, as we are sanctified, that since we're a work in progress, as we progress, it improves our witness. It helps us be salty salt and bright lights. 
in, the, in our world. And that's what God, God calls us for. And so as we read through this, this section of text in Philippians, Paul tells us that we are works in progress. And the six observations that we see from the work in progress is on this slide covering up <clears throat> the um, under construction. It says, and one more, it says that we're under construction, God's still working, and here's the six observations. We realize we have not arrived. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, as Hebrews tells us. And since, since we're works under construction, we don't dwell on past mistakes. We know we have the past mistakes. We learn from those past mistakes, but we don't dwell on them. We trust that God forgives us, and we also trust, number four, for God to lead us. We make progress, and we follow examples of godly men and women. Number six, uh, I think I left that one off. We follow the examples of godly men and women in our life. Okay? So, we're going to close with what Paul said in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. Your work under construction. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Paul tells us why. Because it's God who works in us. God is working in us, and he is working through us. It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Amen? Amen. Amen. So God is working in you, and God is working in me in order to fulfill his good purpose. As we close today, we're going to sing our final hymn, and then I'm going to ask that God's blessing will be upon each of us as you go forth this day, and as we are his hands and feet in the world. We're going to sing Just As I Am on page 417. Please join me as we sing 417. <clears throat> sisters, I am so thankful that you're able to join us this morning and that you could be here as we uh, celebrate 
our love for God as we celebrate what he's doing in us and as we celebrate mothers on this great Mother's Day. So please join with me as we close with prayer. Lord, we come before you again as we close this time, as we close this time of, of, of praising you through song, rejoicing, and the day that you've made, a day for us to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, thank you so much for being the great, awesome God that you are, and thank you for allowing us to, to be partners in your ministry and in your purpose. Thank you for working in us and, and through us to accomplish your will, your good pleasure. And Lord, we also just thank you for mothers. Thank you for giving us the mothers who, who helped us along in life, that helped us understand the way that we should go. Lord, thank you for their tenderness, for their strength. And I just ask that your hand of blessing will be upon them today as, as they are celebrating or celebrated, um, even though in some cases it will be remote. Lord, please, if you can help us to get back together in, in, in each other's presence again and can do that um, without fear and trembling, because if we fear and tremble, it should be at your presence and before you only. Lord, not because of this virus out there. Help us to get back together. Move our governor, our, our state. Just, just open the doors, Lord, please, is what our request is. But in all things, we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.